Greetings, I'm Barent, and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. Today we're going to be doing a Kickstarter preview playthrough of Rogue Angels Legacy of the Burning Suns. This is going to be a super cool game. There's so many awesome mechanics going on in this game that I am super pumped for this one. This is, at its core, technically a dungeon crawler with great story moments and branching narrative paths that are going to bring you to different parts of how this game totally unfolds around you. I'm super excited to show you what this game is all about. This game is by Emil Larson, and he was nice enough to send me one of the prototypes that he has out there. So anything you see in this video is completely prototype. None of it is final work. Even this page right here could be adjusted as time goes forward, but I don't know why you would. That's a fantastic looking cover page as far as I'm concerned. I'm so excited to get this on top of a box. In this video, I'm gonna do a playthrough of chapter two, but I'm gonna explain a little bit how we got there. I'm gonna explain the characters we have, and I'm gonna talk about all the different mechanics and how this game plays and what you can expect if you back Rogue Angels. This will be coming out February 1st of 2022. At that time, you'll see a link to it up here in the corner. Please click on that to go to the Kickstarter page and back this project if you wish. I'm certainly gonna be a day one backer on this. There are so many cool elements I'm excited to show you. Let's get to it. If you're excited to see what is in store for our characters in Rogue Angels Legacy of the Burning Suns, then I need you to meet me at the co-op shop. When starting a new campaign for Rogue Angels Legacy of the Burning Suns, you're going to pick your characters or you can hand out characters in completely random order. At the time of this recording, the amount of characters that you're going to have access to is going to be about 20. And that, of course, could change as the game develops. Can you believe that? 20 characters. And each one of them plays completely different. They are asymmetric characters and they've all got cool things going for them that are really unique. We have, for example, a cyborg here. This is a Neomorph and we have a Terran. All these characters are going to play completely different. When you do play solo, if you do, you have to play with at least two characters. Otherwise, this game can play up to four characters, and this is for ages 16 plus and lasts about 90 to 120 minutes per mission. Let's go ahead, dive in. We're going to only pick two characters for this, so I'm not overwhelmed. I'm not going to play the cyborg. You'll have to see him on another playthrough, or maybe have to pick it up and play it yourself. Like I said, there are 20 in total, and we're only going to see two. Each one are going to have their own backstories about who they are and what they do, and in here's just a sample of some of the cards that they'll be having in their dossier here that they're going to control the character during the playthrough. Let's crack both of these open and take a look. This is Bacillus. This is what your card will look like for the very first chapter, which we are not going to be playing. It's a very introductory chapter that teaches you a little bit on how to move and how to shoot and play your cards. And it talks about your shields and your focus right here, gaining rerolls. So we're not going to be worrying too much about this side, but I do want to point out exactly how everything is here and laid out. So as you play through the first mission, it does introduce you to this game really, really well. It doesn't just throw everything at you all at once. It gives you everything over a little bit of time, at least you can understand your character as you go forward. For example, we have a focus over here. He has three focus and he's going to be able to reroll die based on those. He has three shields, I sorry, two focus and three shields. As he takes damage, he's going to lose a shield. If you ever run out, you're going to start taking actual damage cards, which look like this right here. And we may see these during the playthrough, but I, in case we don't, I want to show you this mechanic right here. This is one of my favorite things about it. There's a lot of really cool mechanics. This one's really cool. This is a damage card. So this is a concussion. And when you gain this card, it's going to fit into one of your slots down here and block up that slot. On this card, you see three different sections. You can personally make this game more difficult for you instead of basing it, making it more difficult for the entire group. These damage cards alone can increase your difficulty in this game. So if I were just playing for the first time, I may not want to increase my difficulty. So when I draw a concussion, I'm going to do what it says on the first part here. It says when drawn, place this card down in this slot, which would be right down here, and it would gum up this slot and I wouldn't be able to use it. 
if I want to make the game a little bit more harder, I would be able to give myself an ongoing. So now any of my movement cards are going to allow me to move one less space because I have this concussion. If I wanted to play on even more difficulty, I can include all three of these things. And it says here, when discarded, move an action card one cooldown to the right. So as we gain our action cards here, we're going to be moving them down. But if they go up, it's going to gum up our slots. So you can increase the difficulty per character just based on this deck alone, this injury deck. That's a really cool mechanic that I haven't seen very often. Let's continue on. We also are going to have a special ability for each one of our characters that we play with. Like I said, each character plays completely different, so that's a really cool way to get back into this game and try it again. And the different choices you make in the game are going to send you down different paths, and eventually you'll come to an actual story mission for your character that your entire group can go on and gain some more abilities or items for that particular character that you would only uncover if you played this character through in the campaign. So super cool things going Going on. The last thing we have is an activation token. We're going to flip this after each action. The activation. Every character gets one activation per turn, and then we undo everybody's activation. And again, you can choose who wants to go first, and then it goes in or in the different in the order you choose. And then once everybody has taken a turn during that round, you'll flip it again and go on and on, as seen in other dungeon crawlers. This is the introductory side. I'm going to flip this card and show you yet again another mechanic that is amazing. So again, we have Bacillus. Now this Bacillus, this time he'll, some of this has changed. We've lost all the t writing on this card. And now we have still the same ability here that says tactical support drone adjacent allies have one free reroll per action on their turn so they don't have to use their focus. This part over here I want to bring your attention to. This is your personality diagram down here. As you can see, there's a couple little black parts there. And for those two black parts, we're going to gain tokens that are going to adjust the way some of our cards react as we play through the game. For example, if we ever decide to play this card right here, notice there's a special part down here on the orange. I could choose to boost this card by using one of my personality tokens here. These are going to expand as you go through the game based on the choices you make in the campaign. So if you went down, you may eventually gain three three more in this category, maybe one in this category, and that's going to adjust the way some of these cards are played. It's really an awesome system. I'm excited to see how this all unfolds as we go through a campaign of this game at some point in the future. Over here we have our scars. As your character fails missions, they're going to gain scars. Each time you gain scars, it could affect how they're going to perform in some of the later missions, and once these are all filled up, your character is dead and you have to choose a new one, which would be absolutely tragic, but that's okay. The game must go on. I'm really super excited to see how these personality traits unfold as we play through. This is a really cool system. So we're going to add these two tokens to our character right here so you can see how that action, how these actions are going to affect our character. We do get a hand of cards. Every one of these cards is ready for us and we can play them down and the numbers here is where they're going to slot in and they're going to slowly move off the board and come back to our hands and give us the ability to play them. Now you only get to do two actions per turn so you'd only be able to play two of these cards Cards. There are a couple other actions you can do which are found on our handy dandy little reference thing here. The actions are play one action card. We can also concentrate, which means we will gain two focus, giving us the ability to re-roll our dice. In this game, you can re-roll a die more than once as long as you have the focus to pay for it, which is pretty cool. So if you really wanted to see something happen, you could probably have it happen. It may cost you a lot of focus to do it. The other one you can do is rest, which is going to move all cards one slot on the cooldown track. So it's going to move in this way, hopefully gaining them back. At the end of your activation, no matter how many activations you do, once you do both, I should say, you have to take a mandatory rest action moving some of these cards off the board, which is neat. So no matter what, you're always going to be having these cards cycle off the board. That's Bacillus. We'll see how some of these cards at work in gameplay as we play, but let's go ahead and check out our extra character. This is our second character. This is Vera. She has a deck of cards. We also have standees for our characters. I forgot to mention that I have Bacillus' standee right here. He looks pretty cool, doesn't he? <laughs> We're going to continue on. Uh, this is her power. It says, Human Resolve. When you are more than two spaces away from the nearest ally, I have two free reroll act per action, which is kind of cool. She can almost always guarantee something to happen that she wants to have happen. And of course, if I stand next to him, he's going to give me a free reroll. So she's going to have rerolls all over the place. Not to mention, look at all this focus she has. It's out of control. She does have one in her personality diagram that gives her inspiring. One for inspiring. Here's the other four. Dominating, 
cautious and supportive. Those are the different personality traits that you can gain through the game. Pretty cool. She has a deck of cards. And the other thing you're going to gain when you open up your dossier is a legacy element to the game. Your actions in the game, how you, or I should say, how you react to different races or groups in the game are going to decide how your character develops in the story. Say you decide to kill a lot of people or you, and, and if, or certain factions, or you help certain factions, you're going to gain points in either direction. Now, they're not like good and bad because there's never really a good and bad way to do it. Every action you do has a consequence is more how it works. And the consequence you do in a certain way could not necessarily make you look as a bad person to this faction, but it might make you look like a very strong person or a threat that might make them think twice before they actually attack you. Or if you get too much in, let's say, like the more, I shouldn't say good category, but if you go in the opposite direction, you may be perceived as weak to that faction as opposed to somebody that helps the faction. So you never know exactly how it's going to play out, but the, that's one of the legacy elements in the game, along with this little track right here. So there are some cool legacy elements. Don't forget the scars here. Again, legacy element as well, because as these go through, things are going to unfold for you in the game as well. Vera is all set. We have Bacillus all set. Let's take a look at what is coming next. Digital Blood is the beginning of our second chapter, so let's go ahead and read a little bit about our mission briefing. We do have Umbrellus. He's in person. In the last video, he was in comms. He was on another ship, or get it, we had to get to the ship, I should say, and now we're actually with him in person. Let's go ahead and see what he has to say. I don't want to bore you with the history lessons about the assemblies. Continued attempts at flushing out the Hellfire pirates of this system. But it is worth noting that the Hellfires have been up to much more than just regular pirating after they got their asses handed to them in the Hellfires campaigns. Rumors have it that the pirates have allowed various corporations and factions to establish research outposts within vexation, earning them vast sums of protection money. The goal of these facilities is to develop new antimatter technology that can reshape entire planets, maybe even stars themselves. And since it happens outside of the assembly's jurisdiction, everyone seems to turn a blind eye. My people will, of course, pay you and your team handsomely if you could help me acquire some of their research. It will help us establish colonies and dominance in our region of the galaxy, carving out an area worthy of the polity's colonial ambitions. Now, locating any of these research sites or the primary Hellfire's base, for that matter, is almost impossible to the planet's heavy atmosphere and the complex radiation pattern of the nearby suns. But I've come across a few supply records giving us the first clue of where to start looking. So whenever you're ready, I suggest we get going. When ready, we will continue to see to the mission layout. Now, I want to make sure you understand that, again, this is all prototype. Even this story itself may change as it goes through production. Here's our mission layout. We're going to use map 02. We're going to place the ship, three block paths, three doors, two consoles, and team size patrol droids, R1 through Y2. And we're going to be using the systematic patrolling for our particular enemies for this mission layout. Also over here, it shows us these greens will be added to the board. So let's go ahead and take care of that. Here's a panned out view of the board to show everything we have. Here are the block tokens. We'll not be moving into those areas. These are the three doors that we could go in. And here are the consoles that we have to eventually probably try to take out. We do have our different patrol droids that we're going to put out. They are right here, R1 and R2. Again, completely prototype. But let me show you what you're seeing on this. This here is their health stat. This is their armor value. They don't have any. They do have two speed, they're going to do two damage, and they have a range of three. We're going to place them down in accordance to where it shows us in the book, which is going to be right there and right there. Actually, I'm going to flip them just like that. We also have their card down here that shows us how they're going to be controlled. We have our deck up here. This is also another cool part of this game. This is your ship. And the ship is actually going to be the inside of the box. So when you're playing, the box will actually be down on the board, and your ship is going to be it. It's going to be in there, and you can move in and out of this ship. And so you'll be moving in and out. So it adds an extra element. On top of that, the missions you're playing are going to be in a book. They're not going to be a bunch of tiles laid out all over the board. What you're playing on is a book similar to the Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, the way they did it. They put a book down and you just moved around on the book. So all the art is going to be in the book and it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be absolutely gorgeous. Here's just 
one of the maps, and then we have even more of them as well. So we have this one right here. It's going to be kind of a, another indoor map. Here's another one. So there's all different types of terrain and maps that you're going to be seeing as you play through it. On the back of this map in particular is this awesome outside thing that I'm going to show you once we're done with this actual mission. At this point, I'm also going to place our team down in accordance to where it mentioned in the book. It showed us these four areas here. I'm just going to put them right there. Of course, with four players, you'd put them in all four places, and I can't even imagine how awesome this game is going to be with four players out here. At this point, you also have to pick a commander. They will just say that Balas is going to be our commander for this mission. That can change per mission, but once it's selected for the mission, that's the deal. The commander may have certain things happening to them in the campaign because they're the commander of this mission. Also, any ties are going to be broken by the commander so if there's a 2-2 tie for what you should do according to a decision in this mission that will be the deciding factor. With our mission layout complete let's go back to the book and check out our mission parameters. Now we're back on comms. He must be in the ship and we're out onto the actual board itself. It says, these old refueling stations run on a skeleton crew. So it's highly unlikely you'll run into any sentient beings here, but be aware of their automated security systems. They have droids patrolling the hallways. Make sure you disable their entire security system in one go. That'll shut off the droids and let my crew hack the terminals. Our parameters are as follow. We have our turn limit down here. We're successful if we disable both consoles with two cons within two consecutive turns. Our turn limit is based on the number of players. So we have 12 because we're playing with two players. 15 and 18 are for three and four respectively. These are certain trigger conditions that could potentially change the outcome of this mission. Patrol droids. While on systematic patrolling, which is how they start, a patrol droid moves only one instead of two squares. When I mentioned that this had a two speed, for this mission, they're only going to have one. It says, if the consoles are disabled within two consecutive turns, remove all the patrol droids. Three, if players find themselves within the range and line of sight of the enemies at the end of a player turn, or if they attack an enemy, or if they fail to disable both consoles within two consecutive turns, we're going to change their attack or their card to automated attack and we're gonna change the goal to eliminate all enemies and decrease the turn token by two, three, or four. We're gonna be doing it for two because we have two characters, making it making less turns for us to actually get through this mission. So we might wanna to try to be as sneaky as we can, but if all else fails, we'll just use our guns and smash, smash, smash. We do have a failure here. If the turn token reaches zeros or all players are unconscious, we are having to restart the mission. Instead of gaining a scar for the first few missions, they just want you to replay them so you can understand how this game is totally played. You're also going to notice down here, even on the second mission, it says, if success, continue to C2 mission update 1A. If successful through trigger 3, continue to C2 mission update 1B. We're already seeing branching paths happen inside the story, even in the second mission of this game, which is absolutely awesome. Let's start with Basilis. He's got a number of cards. First, let's take a look at these. This means it's an interact action. We've got a lot of interact actions. We also have an effect and we have a move action. So those are the three different types of cards you're gonna see. The interact cards are the ones you're gonna see the most often. But we have an effect card here if we wanted to play it, which would cost us, we'd be able to put it in one. One thing I wanna mention is that you can place these cards anywhere you want in these tracks. Just because it says one, I could place it all the way up in four. And that would actually be good for this effect because it says both your basic actions have plus one dice when you roll them. So if I place this here as my first action, and then decide to use my move card, I'd be able to roll two dice, which are found right here, along with whatever else is on this card. So for example, I'd be able to move one square plus whatever my dice rolled, which have either a plus one, a plus two, a shield, which means I'd be able to gain back a shield. We also have this, which means I'd be able to get two movement points out of it. And we have ones that are both either a plus one or a move. So say I was attacking somebody, I could either get plus one of my damage or say I wanted, or I could attack for whatever the damage is on the weapon and gain a move if I want to. So there's nothing on this dice that's actually bad for you. It's all going to help you out in some way, most likely. Of course, if you have full shields and roll shield, well, that's too bad for you. But most of the time, everything on this car, these dice are going to be beneficial. So I think the first thing we're going to do is play our Proton Power bank in the fourth slot. Now remember, as we rest, these cards are going to be moving down, but as long as this is in one of these slots, it's going to remain active. 
And at this point, I'm now going to play, I think, my movement card to try to get up to the doors so that I can open them to get to those consoles. Notice this one's a zero. It's going to be played off your board and will come right back to your hand immediately. So you'll always have access to both your in basic interact and your basic move card. And you can never remove these from your deck at any point. These always have to stay in your deck. So we're going to play our basic move, which is going to give us the ability to roll one dice, but this card is allowing us to roll two for a basic action. So let's see what happens here. I'm going to roll these up. I got a shield and a plus one. Well, you know, the plus one's kind of nice. I now get to move two spaces, but the shield is not helping me at all. Now I could spend one of my focus if I want to to re-roll this, but two speed is enough to get to where I want to be. Our goal is this console right over here. So with two speed, I can move one, two to be adjacent to that door. And all six spaces here are technically adjacent to this door. So you don't actually have to be standing right in front of it in order to interact with it. I could be over here if I wanted to. And actually, I think I am going to place myself right over there so I can stay as far away from those droids as I can. Having performed my two actions, this one will resolve and come back to my hand automatically. I will do a free rest, moving this down one. And I will flip my token to show that I have activated him. We'll move our tracker down, and according to our card here, we have played our two actions, we've done our free rest, we have flipped our activation token, we've moved the token down one. We're now going to check to see if our mission is updated. Nope. So we're going to now move into our enemy turns. We're going to start with the red enemies, then move the yellow enemies. We don't have any yellow enemies out here right now, just red ones. So we're going to look at their card here, and it says systematic patrolling. If the last activated player interacted with an object, the activated enemy will use the exclamation point instead. Otherwise, we're going to go with the lowest initiative, and then we're going to go to the second lowest initiative. And both of them are just going to move toward the nearest player. Remember, these are just patrolling droids, so they're just going to be moving towards us. They don't have anything to worry about right now. If, of course, we did an interact action, which we did not, we did not interact with any objects, we would be using the last activated player. So instead, we're going to move both of these towards the nearest player, which is going to be, of course, Basilisk. And these enemies and everything in the board can move diagonal, so they're just going to move up one and one. Also, these, again, are prototypes. In the actual version, they're going to have these dials that are going to have their health value on them that you can spin around on, which is pretty cool. That's where they're going to go. That's the end of their activation. We're going to move to our next person. We're going to move to Vera. Vera doesn't have any effects, but she's got three different move actions and three different types of interact actions, which are amazing. Like, for example, I could use this jetpack. I can jump over objects or empty spaces for five squares, and then, but you cannot jump over walls or closed doors. Makes sense. I get to roll one die, and I didn't mention this when I used Basilisk. The die roll, when you're getting the pluses or anything like this, so if I would have gotten plus two, what that is augmenting is the numbers inside the parentheses. So, for example, it would augment the number of squares that I'd be able to go. Where, for example, if we decide to use our comms wristband here, it's going to interact with an adjacent object for two, and whatever my, if I would have gotten any pluses, I decide to use, it would be for whatever that would number would be, plus the parentheses numbers here of two. On top of that, I could use any of these to add to what my character can do. Nothing on this card, but let's see if I can find one. Here's one. This one allowed me to move an ally too. I could use this. Now, you'll get these back at the beginning of your next mission, but these are mission specific, unless, of course, something in the mission or a card of some kind gets you gain these back. Another thing I want to mention is as you play through the campaign, you can add stickers to these, similar to other games that give you more choices. Say your characters are starting to see this the odd interactions that this character has made, has moved it down this path, and we've gained a lot of these personality tokens over on this side. I might want to start putting stickers on some of my cards that give me the ability to activate those personality tokens. So there's a lot of cool ways you can customize each one of your characters in this game as you're going forward. Now, of course, I've put all my cards on the table here and have absolutely no idea what I'm doing with them, just talking about it. Let's figure out what she's going to do for sure on this turn. Vera is first going to use a basic move. She's only two spaces away from that door, so let's see if we can get to that door. I get to move a total of one, plus what I roll from my die. Let's roll this up and see what I get. I got plus one, so that's going to give us two movement points. Since it's a zero card, it's going to go right back into my hand. Let's move our character. We'll move right up to that door so we can start interacting with it and hopefully be able to make a chance or get through this and hopefully get to that console as fast as we can. 
So for my second action, we are going to use our COM wristband, which is going to go into our second slot here. And I'm going to be able to interact with an object for two plus. I get to roll two dice to see if I can get some more. And I'm going to show you what the, how we perform these actions on the doors in just a second. We're attempting to hack this door is what we're doing. Because all the doors are locked and we have to find out the passcodes on the doors in order to get through them. So let's roll our two dice and see if we get any extra ones. We got a plus two. And then I can either gain one movement point or I can gain a plus one. We're going to gain the movement points. That way we can move into the room after we're able to perform this hack, if we're able to open the door. Let's demonstrate that. This is another cool part of this game. When you go to hack a terminal or door or anything else in this game, you're going to be drawing tokens from this bag. And you're going to attempt to draw three of either the red, purple, or blue tokens to be successful. The white tokens are considered wild, and they can be any color you want. So you're going to place them into the bag and draw out as many as you have that you were successful in. We were successful for four, so we get to draw out four of these. We're going to draw them one at a time, and we can choose to stop at any time we want. So I'm going to give this bag a good old shuffle here. And remember, this is all prototype materials. This is not what these are finally going to look like. We're going to start by grabbing one. We have gotten, let's see, what is it? Oh, we got a white one. That's fantastic. We're going to keep drawing here. We're going to draw out a blue one. We're going to keep going. I've gotten two blue, or one blue and one white and a red. Let's, not, let's just get all three colors. That'll be four colors. That'll be awesome. Let's see what the last one is. It's a blue one. So now that we've drawn our four tokens, and I have to, I didn't choose to stop at any time, we now have to choose a color. I'm going to choose blue, which means we'll be putting the red one back into this bag, and we will be removing these from this mission. We no longer are going to be able to draw these out. Successfully hacking the door, we will remove the door, and I get to move one more because of our die roll here of that one movement point. We performed our two actions. We are now going to do our end of turn free rest action. So I'm going to move this down to the one slot. At this point, I will flip my activation token, and we'll move the time tracker down to 10. Now it will be our patrolling droids turns again. And they're going to move, well, now they're going to move. If the last activated player interacted with an object, the activated enemy will use the exclamation point instead. So it is going to move towards the last activated player, which is again going to be over here. It's going to be Vera. We'll just move them up like that. With both of our characters completed, we're going to reflip over their activation tokens and begin again. I'm not sure if I want Basilisk to go. I think we're going to start with Vera this time. Sadly, her calm wristband is down there, but that's okay. We're going to use her basic movement yet again. That way we can move towards that console and maybe we can start hacking it. I get to roll one die. Let's see how we do. I get an extra two movement points. That's fantastic. So we have a total speed of three, which is going to be able to get us next to that computer console. And now we're going to play our basic interact card because none of the other interacts I have are going to be able to help us with that computer. The only one I had would have been my comms wristband. And sadly, <laughs> we already used it. So we're going to use this as our basic interact. We are now going to see how we do. First, our movement, one, two, we're going to go to there. And at this point, it says when you are more than two spaces away from the nearest ally, you have two free rerolls per action. That is her ability. And one, two, I can't really see this guy. So I'm going to be at over two spaces away. So I'm going to get two free rerolls for my interact action. So we're going to play this basic interact action. I only get to add one die. So let's see what our roll is. We got one in a shield. So right now I'm pulling two tokens. That is not enough. I'm going to use one of my rerolls. I got two speed. That is definitely definitely not enough. We'll use our second reroll. We still only have one movement and a speed. At this point, I'm going to start using my focus. We're going to use our first of our four focus tokens we have and see how this goes. We'll roll it up. I got plus two. That's exactly what I wanted. I now get to go ahead and grab three tokens out of that bag. Now, the interesting thing about the basic interact card is it can do anything almost. It can deal damage. It can interact with an object. And it can also heal adjacent unconscious characters for whatever damage they have. So there, this is a really, this card can never be removed from your thing. And it can do is basically your anything card you want it to do. Of course, it is really basic, as you can see. I had to use a lot of different rerolls to even try to get it up to three, which still is not guaranteeing me the ability to activate this console. We'll see how it goes. Let's start drawing some tokens. I have, of course, removed these two blue and a white one from the bag because we've already used that to open the door. Let's draw our first token. And it is a, what is it? It's a white. Oh, wow. Okay, now I just need two of the same colors. And that'd be absolutely glorious. We got a red one. Come on, we need another red one. That would be amazing. Let's see how we do. Wow, we got another red one. That was perfect. <laughs> 
couldn't have asked for anything more. So we were able to activate that console. Now remember, it has to be in two consecutive turns. So I'd, I might have actually jumped the gun here and been too excited and too happy to be able to get through this. But now I need to get Basilis over there, and he's got to somehow get that next console done almost immediately. We'll see how it goes. But we were able to complete this console, so this one has been hacked. That's fantastic. Wow. And we will remove these now from the bo that bag that we have, and I'm going to flip my action token. I get to move this off the board so it goes back to my hand so she actually has all of her cards. And once that is completed, since we finished our free end of turn free rest and flipped our activation token, we are now going to move the turn token down to nine. Also at this point, I am going to check my mission objectives. They're not updated yet because I needed to hack both consoles. So we'll move to the enemy step. At this point, I'm not sure I can get to their console. We're just going to give it a shot. I'm going to play my basic move card here. I get to roll an extra die because of our proton power bank. We'll see how this goes. This might just be, and we might just end up shooting these <laughs> droids. We'll see how this goes. I got two speed plus one. So this might be okay. I get to move one, two, three, four spaces. That's still not quite enough to get to that door. But, you know, that'll be good enough for what I think we're going to do next. We're <laughs> just probably going to shoot the droid. Basilisk will move one, two, three, four to right there using his two speed plus his two extra speed from the die that we rolled right there. He is now within one, two, and if we look for line of sight, line of sight, of course, is center to center. That's really easy. That's all you have to check. There And any of these that kind of protrude out here, it's all just on the grid. Even though it moves a little bit over, that's okay. It's still considered just on the grid. So we're going to be able to move, actually have a line of sight to this, so I think we're going to play our LP Plasma Blaster here. I get to roll one die and it's going to deal two damage to an enemy within three spaces. If the enemy has any shields, I get plus one dice on my next action this turn. Well, I'm only going to get two actions, so this is the only other one we're doing. We're going to place this down in two. I do want to get this back as fast as I can. So let's go ahead and see how we do against these robots. I get to roll an extra die. This is going to change how this mission's about to happen, but I'm not going to have to, I don't get the extra one because this is not a basic action. I do get plus one, so I am gonna do three damage to the R1 robot here. He's gonna go down to two if I can move the paper clip, which is pretty easy there. We'll put it there just to show that we he now has two damage left, but of course he is still alive and kicking. Basilisk has performed his two actions. We'll go ahead and do our mandatory free rest to move those down. We'll flip our activation token and we will move our time tracker down one more. We're at eight. At this point, we have activated one of the triggers. We've activated the third one. We have actually attacked one of the enemies. So now we are going to decrease the turn token by two. We are going to change their activation card to automated attack. And it's also going to change our goal now to eliminate all enemies instead of disable both consoles. So let's go ahead and grab our new AI card. We now are going to be playing with this one. It says if activated enemy did not move during its activation, include one of these as its last action. The first thing it's going to do is move toward the last activated player and then deal damage to the nearest player. Then the next one is going to do damage to the nearest player and then move towards the last activated player. So they are kind of in reverse order here. Of course, if they did not move at all, they're going to deal one damage to all adjacent players. Oh, that's absolutely brutal. Let's go take care of all of this. The first thing we have to do is take away two of our time, then we're going to activate our enemies. We have the first one that's going to move with the lowest initiative is going to move towards the last activated player, which was Basilisk, so he's going to move next to him. But when we look at this character card here, it has two speed, three range, and two damage. They're going to want to stay at range if that's what they have. And if they're moving a large amount of movement, the movement they want is enough to get them just in range and then they will stop. So he's going to stop right where he is because he's just fine and he's going to do damage to the nearest player and that means he is going to do two damage to Basilisk. Basilisk will first take the shield hit so he is down to one shield. With that enemy complete, we'll move to our next one, which is this one. It is going to damage the nearest player and then move towards the last activated player. It can't actually see through this wall, so it's not going to be able to attack, so it's just going to move one up to here to be at one, two, three range of Basilisk. So <laughs> these two things are ready to take him out in the next turn, which is going to be terrible. I will re-flip over all of their activation tokens so we can now choose which one wants to go first. I think it's going to be Basilisk since he's got the enemies right in front of him. And I think what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to do, I think we're going to just try to move up there 
and maybe try to get this tail defense going. Gain one shield for each adjacent enemy. For each shield you gain, you may move one space afterwards. So I could actually move potentially two spaces after I do this actual movement here. We'll see if that works. Or I could just move up and potentially attack them. Oh, check this out. I think I might use this. This might be awesome. I can choose a space within six spaces and deal two unblockable damage to all adjacent to all objects so that's gonna be absolutely anything you could possibly damage in this game walls of course i you can't take out unless of course the scenario has, says otherwise but i can take out any uh, two damage to all objects within one range of the chosen space now notice nothing here is in parentheses so the die roll i'm rolling is not going to be affecting this card at all but that's gonna be okay we're gonna place this in number four but i do still get to roll a die maybe i can gain back some shields that would be awesome nope i got a plus one which isn't going to help me at all but that's okay and it's not a basic action so i'm not able to gain the extra die which is okay but doing that is going to be able to take out one of our character enemies and hopefully do some damage. Well, we'll do some damage to the other one. This enemy right here we know has two damage on it, so we're going to remove that enemy. This one is going to take two damage because I'm going to choose that space right here. So it's going to damage both of these. So we're going to move this down to three. At this point, I now get to perform another action if I wish to, and I think I am. I'm going to use a move action. I'm going to make this thing come to us. So I'm going to play my basic move, and I'm going to roll my two dice and see how far away from this guy I can get. I can get two spaces away, and I can gain a, either another movement point or a shield. We're going to gain a shield, bringing our shields back up to two, and we're going to move a total of one, two, three, four, one, two, three, what, three spaces. Yep, three spaces. We're going to move back one, two, three. That's just fine. We're going to hope that our human can come out and save us. Having performed two actions, we're going to flip our activation token, move our time tracker down to five, and we get to do a free rest, giving us back our plasma rifle and moving these two down to there. Okay, I think we're sitting a little bit better than we were just a little while ago with two enemies about ready to tag us. Our movement put me a little out of camera, but that's okay. If the activated enemy did not move during its activation, include one or include the exclamation point. Well, we did move. So now the one of the lowest initiative is going to move towards the last activated player. So it's going to move one, two, three, no, two. It only moves two spaces, I think. It has a two speed. So it's going to go one, two. It has a range of three, one, two, three. It cannot attack our character, which is fantastic. We got it out of there. Oh my gosh, that was <laughs> fantastic that I got to move that extra space. Vera's going to use one of her movement cards. She's going to use dash. It's going to, she's going to place it in two. Now, remember, I could place it in three or four if I want to, but I think I might want to get it back more than to keep it up here. She's going to get to roll two dice for this, and let's see if she's able to get some good movement out of this. Also, at this point, I could have spent my token to allow an ally to move two spaces. So if we were still worried about Basilisk being hit, I could have potentially moved him even farther away. But, of course, this is a once-per-mission token that I have. And as you play through, you'll gain more tokens, being able to use more and more powers on these cards. Kind of like leveling up your guy, which is really awesome. We've got a couple of plus one and a shield. Well, that's pretty terrible. Good news, we have this when you are more than two spaces away from the nearest ally, you have two free rerolls. We'll reroll this shield because I'm at full shields. So that's not going to help us. We got two. That's fantastic. So now I got plus three, which means we're going to get a total of five movement. I think that will be just fine. Vera is going to move one, two, three, four. I think to right there, because her next action she's going to use is she's going to use her pistol here. Now, of course, the art on these cards haven't been finalized yet. This is, I'm going to say it over and over, is a prototype. I'm going to place it in my number three activation area. I get to roll two dice, and I deal three damage to an enemy within three spaces. So one, two, three, I can shoot that. So we're going to do three damage, which is enough to kill it. So, uh, it, But it is still important you have to do roll your dice, because I can maybe get some movement and move myself away or something. Oh, look at this. I got three movement. I can shoot this guy and move three spaces. So we're going to do that. I'm going to shoot him for three, which means we have eliminated this person. He has no shield, so he's going to take all three damage. And then I get to move three. Let's move towards that console. One, two, three towards that console. We've played our two actions. We're going to end with our free rest action, moving our two cards down. I'm going to flip my activation token, and we'll move our time tracker down to four. At this point, we will now check our updated missions, and we have to update them. We were able to take out both of those droids. It does say here, if success through trigger three, continue to C2 mission update 1B. 
we sadly were not able to do the consoles. In this game, there are a lot of characters that are probably really good at moving around and being able to hack things. We saw that Vera was, but she wasn't paired with somebody that really was able to do that. Basilis is not the greatest at moving really fast, and he couldn't get to their console. But that's okay. We're going to continue on. Trigger 3, C2, Mission Update 1B. Here's our new mission update. We are going to remove one blocked path, which is located right here. We're going to place one door right there. Then we're also going to place a point of interest right there inside of that. That's fantastic. Notice that none of the other things on here have told us to do anything with them. We leave everything on the board that is there and only change what is right down here. So that console is still going to be up here and the doors are still going to be here. And we may have to use them later on this mission. But for right now, this is all that's going to change. Of course, we've got more info from this guy. He says, if you have a hammer, all problems start to look like nails, don't they? I guess that also is true for guns. Well, at any speed, good job, Commander. We have access to the station and are performing a scan of the station and its data. Wait a minute. We are detecting a severe gas leak inside the station. We cannot see if this is caused by your destruction or something overwhelming the system. Get to the fuel control room and see if you can shut down the leak and start the ventilation. So we have new mission parameters here. We're going to put our turn token here on two. We have two? Oh boy, two. And we have to get the commander adjacent to the point of interest. Now remember, the commander is Basilisk. So we've got to get Slowpoke McGraw here over to this point of interest within two turns. <laughs> That's probably not going to happen. We're going to see what our trigger condition here is. Turns spend after the turn token reaches zero results in every player losing one focus and one shield in the beginning of their turn. So it's not a full end lose condition if we get lose all the time, but we're going to start taking damage from the gas leak that's happening, which is pretty sweetness. Now, of course, if we succeed, we're going to continue to C2 mission update number two. I've placed down our door and our point of interest, and we're going to move our time tracker to two. Again, I don't think there's any way he's going to get in here before two actions. Right here, we're going to, I think, <laughs> we're going to start by giving back our activation tokens. We get to choose who gets to go first, and it's going to be a complete shock to you, but Vera's going to try to get down there and open this door all in one turn. Think it can happen? I don't know. Let's find out. Okay, good news, bad news. She's pretty quick, and she at least has her ability to hack in my hand, which is sweetness. Sadly, it would have been really nice to have this dash card available to me, because not only can I move two and roll two dice, I could have spent this right now to allow B Basilis to move in two spaces, getting him closer to that door, because he has, he's super slow. We're going to instead go super fast. I'm going to use my jetpack. This thing's sweet. I'm going to be able to move five spaces. Now, sadly, it doesn't have any way of using that token but that's okay i'm going to place it down in three i'm almost tempted to place it down in four and i think i am i'm going to place it down in four not sure if that's a good call but she'll be able to move five because that way i can place this down in two and hopefully get this back faster i'm not sure if i want this back faster or if i want to get this back faster i don't know what's coming next i think we're going to play it in four we're going to see how this goes i do get to roll one die I don't really know what that's going to do for me. It gives me plus one speed. Why not? I can get an extra speed, so now I get to move six. Not sure if that's going to help. But we're going to get next to that door, and we're going to use our calm wristband after that. Vera is going to do her greatest Boba Fett impression and go one, two, three, four, and not fly into something and kill himself. We're going to move right next to this door from this side, and we're going to attempt to hack it. That way he can come through and hopefully come around and stand next to this thing. We'll see if this works. I don't know. It's going to be the worst plan ever. But she's here. She's ready to go. We're going to hack that door. My calm wristband is allowing me to roll two dice to see if we can add anything to it. I got three. I don't think I can do much better than that. So we get to draw five tokens out of this bag. Come on, we have to be able to match something. It's time to hack that door. Let's start drawing our tokens. The first one we have is a purple token. So we'll place that down there. I am going to keep on drawing. We got ourselves another purple token. That's awesome. Now let's just for sake here that say we only got a two and I decide to take purple well I've only got two I need to get a third one I can place these next to the door there to signify that those are two purple hacks on that door let's say now he comes running around here and he's gonna hack the door and say he gets two he would draw two tokens say he got two red tokens and he decided you know what I think we have a better chance at red than purple so he could take the purple ones away and put red ones you can always kind of change the colors of what you're doing in subsequent actions but we have five we're gonna get this door open in one shot here that's gonna be our plan let's see how we can do. I'm going to grab another token out here if I can. 
We got a white one. That's fantastic. So we got three purple. I'm going to stop at this point. I'm not going to draw any more tokens. There's no reason to. We have three purples. We're able to unlock this door. I have used three of my white tokens out of that bag, though, so it is going to be harder to be able to get this in one shot. So hopefully there's not too much more we have to hack. Her turn is done. We're going to flip her activation token. We're going to move our time tracker to one. And we're going to do our one mandatory rest, bringing our dash card back to our hand, which is just fine. I'm really excited to get some of these cards back to my hand. Basilisk is going to use a double basic move action. He's going to place it right there. He gets to roll one die, and let's see what he gets. He gets himself two more speed. That's perfect. So he's going to be able to move three spaces. That's not quite enough to get to that place, so we're going to get this back to our hand. For our second action, we are going to play our basic move card yet again, roll our die, and see what we get. We got plus two, so we get a total of three six movement we can do on this turn. That's awesome. I'm going to just right here do our free rest action. And we're also going to flip our activation token and move our time track too. I know I did those out of order, but just for ease of recording, I'm going to move him one, two, three, four, five to right there. He is now adjacent to the point of interest, and we didn't take any damage. I am so sorry I called you slow draw McGraw. He is actually able to pull through and got to that point of interest, which means we are now going to look through here. We've got our two perform actions. We did our free rest and flipped our activation token. We moved our time token, and we are now going to update our missions because we were able to complete the objective that was given to us. Mission update two, we're again on comm. We're picking up a life form inside the fuel control room with you. Check it out, Commander. We will not have our first job jeopardized by a witness. Oh, it's a female engineer, and look, she's standing right next to us. Please don't hurt me. I wasn't trying to. Please, just let me go, and I'll be on my way. I won't tell anyone about you. I, I just work here from time to time. I, I swear. <laughs> and then he's going to come in next. Don't trust her. What would she be doing here if she wasn't in league with the Hellfires? What about that gas leak? That could be her action. She's also a witness, and we can't have that. Dispose of her now. Nobody will be around to talk about us, and nobody will miss a human in these parts of the galaxy. Kill her. That's an order. No, no, please. I, I beg you. So here we have our first choice. Will you kill the female engineer? Yes or no? It says right here, players may debate, but all are then called to vote simultaneously, with, of course, the commander's vote breaking ties. There are only two people here, so if I voted yes and he voted no, then he could break the tie with a no if he wanted to. And let's go that route. I'm going to say that Vera is going to say, yes, let's kill her. And Basil is going to say, no, we're not going to kill her. We're going to keep her just as she is, because after all, she's just a female engineer staying around. I don't know why Vera wants to kill her. Poor Vera. <laughs> She's not very nice. We're then going to continue here. If the team voted yes, C2B, mission update three. If the team voted no, which is what we did, we'll continue to C2A, mission update three. Again, more branching paths, so many different ways to do each of these missions. Here's our C2 mission update three. Those that voted yes, which would have been Vera, she's going to paint this symbol into the legacy folder next to Umbressus, which is this guy right here. So in other words, we're gaining favor with him, but favor is not really the word we should use because who knows, to him, as the campaign unfolds, being in favor with him may actually think of, may, he may think you're weak or easily manipulated in some way. So every action you do is not necessarily a good or bad action. It's just going to have consequences down the line. So, for example, those that voted no would paint this in their legacy folder, bringing our technically our favor away from him, or potentially maybe we're seen more as a threat to him. So he may decide more to go with our way of thinking because we're afraid of what we might do to him or something. So it's really cool how he's designing this game. So there isn't really a yes or no answer to any of these things. Everything is just going to have consequences later on down the line. Whether they and we'll be unlocking different different missions. You're never going to see the entire campaign in one playthrough because based on these trackers or certain things you've selected in the actual missions, you may miss complete missions in this game because you just didn't go down that path, which is so cool. So there's so much replay value that's going to be had in these games. Not that I, of course, mention the 20 characters you get to be, which is also awesome. You've already seen that there's a big difference in the cards that even the two that we're playing right now have. Super cool. We're going to continue on. It says right here, when ready, continue below. I'm done talking 
talking, let's continue on with what he has to say. Commander, how dare you? I don't pay you to go against my orders. I hope you know what you're doing. And our female engineer, your white knight syndrome is recommendable, but I'm afraid that your boss was right. Right, okay. <laughs> don't worry, you won't be around to apologize to him. Well, I guess I maybe shouldn't have had her be like this timid engineer. I should have had her be more like an evil person. And I didn't get your name, K.O. I didn't get even get your name, C.O. or K.O. I can't even pronounce his name. I'm just floored by the fact that this person right off the bat was not even a good person. Oh, that's awesome. We have the data. Now get your asses back to the ship ASAP before we all start to regret your decisions. And the interesting thing, of course, since I did let her live, she may come back either soon or maybe even later. This could be a immediate decision that could affect our game or it could be something down the line. So many different ways that this game can be affected. It's super cool. So our mission update four here says we're gonna remove all the blocked paths and we're gonna place down team size amount of sweeper drones in the R1 through R4. And then we're gonna place down team size sweeper drones for a Y1 through Y4. We, of course, are playing with two, so we're putting down R1, R2, and Y1, Y2. So this game does scale based on player count very well because not all these are going to activate. It's not going to be you and then all of them. It's only going to be the red, then the yellow, red, then yellow. So only a certain amount of these characters are going to be performing actions each turn. So it does scale very well and keeps everybody engaged in this game. We're also going to be placing the self-destruct AI mechanic down for these particular enemies and it shows right here we'll be move, removing all those block paths and we'll be adding these droids to these spots here and we're going to of course be cycling our time track as well I guess I spoke too soon that woman just activated a series of sweeper droids they are hard-coded and put on self-destruct mode we can't hack them well I guess this is very much your own causing. We won't be staying around forever. Hurry up. So we have new mission parameters. We're going to set our time tracker to eight. We have to get all the players on board the ship or eliminate all the enemies. A, those not reaching the shift before the time token reaches zero will be recovered after the mission and we're repainting in one of those scars that we saw on the side of our character sheets. Next we have trigger condition. One, the ship. The ship is part of the mission board and can be boarded, exited by players only. Enemies will not move toward or target players already on board the ship. And of course our failure here is if all the players are unconscious, all are removed after the mission and we'll be painting a scar for each one of our characters. And if we failed, we'll be continuing to mission update 5B aftermath. If we are successful, we'll be going to mission update 5A. We'll start by putting our time track to eight. Then I'm gonna take my R1 and R2. We're gonna place them down the board and remove this blocked token. We'll place my Y1 and Y2 up here and remove this blocked token. So even on a small map like this inside those books, we're still using the entire thing over the course of the entire mission, which is pretty cool that he's able to basically give you access to this entire map. Now, of course, that's only one way we could have gone down the mission. If we went down the mission, say we would have killed her, something else may have completely happened. Maybe she still would have activated these droids. Maybe not, who knows? We I guess we'll have to play again to find out. That's the end of our update. So at this point, which is kind of funny, since the mission update has happened, it is now actually the enemy's turn. So we are going to activate the red droids over here. We'll take a look at our self-destruct sequence card. It says, if the activated enemy was damaged last turn, use the exclamation point instead, which is right down here. The last activated player is going to move next to it and then deal un two unblockable damage to itself and all adjacent players, which pretty much be killing it. If we take a look at these self-destruct droids, they've got three health. They don't have any armor, but they move five and they do one damage at range two. So they're going to be able to run right up on us and probably attack us. So we're going to go at the lowest initiative is going to move towards the last activated player, which is going to be Basilis. Then it's going to attack the nearest player. So our R1 is going to move 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to right there. That's its farthest it can go. Sadly, its range is only 2, so it cannot attack the nearest player because my person is three spaces away. And Basilis is not able to be seen by that one. But I have some bad news for him in the next movement here. I can move most distant player. So it's going to move towards this one. 1, 2, 3, four. It's going to move one, two, three, four, five to right here, or five to right there. It always wants to try to stay in 
orthogonal lines if possible. And when potentially targeting characters, it's going to want to target characters. If there's a two, to, if I could have attacked both of these characters, for example, it will always try to attack orthogonally as opposed to any type of diagonal. It will always go after the most orthogonal attack first. So it would attack her even before it would attack him if it had, if it what didn't have it, if it, both of them were viable targets. It's now going to actually attack the nearest player, which at this point will be Basilisk. He is going to take, I think it's the two damage. He's going to take, no, nope, one damage. So Basilisk is going to lose one shield. We'll take that down to one for his shields. And at this point now, I'm going to be able to get back my characters here. We're going to unexhaust them. We're going to gain back our activation tokens here. And we're going to see what our characters can do. I think we're going to probably try to kill these guys and then move or something. I think that might be our best plan of attack here. We're going to first use our proton power pack again. This thing's pretty awesome. It gives us the ability to use our basic actions and we're gonna be doing some running and eventually, so that's good. I'm gonna place it up in my four because it will be activated. I get to roll two dice. I'm also gonna use this token from my personality thing to give myself two movement because we're trying to move here. So I'm gonna use two dice. All your basic actions have plus one. Now these aren't really giving me, oh, wow, look at that. I get plus, so I get two more speed if I want. So I get a total of four speed because I placed, played my token. Now, now, I do want to mention that you can't play the tokens after you roll. Once the card's been played and your tokens have been divvied up, once the dice are rolled, that's it. You have to go with what it is. So say if I didn't need the plus two movement because I just liked what I had, that's not how this works. So I am going to be able to move four spaces, which will get me closer to those droids. Let's see how this works. I'm going to move him one, two, three to right there. I'm not going to use all four of my speed because the next card I'm going to use is I'm going to use my tail defense. And I'm not going to roll any dice, but I'm going to gain one shield for each adjacent enemy. For each shield I gain, I may move one space afterwards. So this is fantastic. I'm allowed to move. I could have saved that token and played it now for an ally to gain a shield, but I don't need to do that because <laughs> she's got full shield still. Since there are two enemies adjacent to me, I'm going to gain back two shields. I'll place this in my one slot right here. Gaining back two shields, that's going to be the end. I'm going to flip my token, get my free rest in here, and we'll move our time track. This will move down to seven. At this point, since there are yellow enemies on the board, we are going to flip the card and now activate our yellow people. It says, if the activated enemy was damaged last turn, use the exclamation point instead. I believe this is going to be very similar. Again, this is only the second mission, so you're not seeing a lot of variation in the way the enemies perform. But I, there are some other characters in this game that we could have potentially gained, attacked. So, for example, here's one we haven't seen, something that uses disorganized attack. So this one's going to move to the nearest player and then attack them, where this one's going to attack and move nearest. And they could also even move away from the nearest player and then attack the nearest player. So it's got all these different ways of attacking. Then on the other side, it's got completely different ideas. It's going to go after the last activated player instead of the nearest player. So some of these cards are really cool, and they have a lot of different ways these enemies are going to react. But these are droids, so I guess it makes sense that they're all very similar in what they do. So they're both going to move towards the nearest player and then the distant player. So the one with the lowest is this person. So they're going to move towards the nearest. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. So it's going to move one, two, three, four to right here. At this point, it is within range and it has line of sight, so it's now going to attack the nearest player. So that means that Vera is going to take one damage, which is going to hit her shields, meaning that she has a total of two shields left on her card. The next one's going to go at the most distant player, one, two, three, four to right there. He is now in range and is able to attack the nearest player. So it's going to attack Bas Basilisk for one, bringing his shields down to two. Both of our Y enemies have activated, so we're going to continue over to Vera's turn now. We'll start with Vera. She actually can move. She's going to use her dash card. I'm going to play it in four. It could be placed here, but there's already cards everywhere, so I can't do it. Sadly, my jetpack is already being used, which would be really cool. But we're going to play dash. I'm also going to spend my token here to allow myself to move an ally two spaces. I get to roll two dice. Let's see how that goes. I got a total of plus one speed and plus one. That's just fine for a movement of four. I think that will be that should work pretty good. The way this is going to work is I do have line of sight 
to Basilisk here, so I can activate that move an ally to spaces. And I can do that before I move if I want to. Or I could move and then move him. But I cannot move through characters, so I couldn't actually move through them, which is kind of sad. Line of sight in this game is actually really easy. It's corner to, or center to center, and the only thing that blocks it will be walls and anything that's outlined in red. You can actually draw line of sight through characters, and you can even interact with things. Say there's a console over here, and I had an interact thing that could interact with something four squares away to try to hack this. I could do that even through these enemies, which is pretty cool. So th that's really how line of sight works, super easy. I'm going to move him one, two, allowing her to move one, two, three, four. At this point, she now has all of her slots are full. She can't do anything. So the only thing she can do is play this basic move card. So she's going to do that, roll up her one die and see how it goes. I've got an extra two speed. That's awesome. So I've got a total of three speed here. So she's going to move one, two, three. That way she's getting closer to the exit. I'm not dealing with these guys. We're just going to run. Vera's turn has ended. I'm going to take her move card, which she would play to gone right back to my hand. This will also go back to my hand, so if I guess he decided to fight, now I could probably do it. We're going to move our two other cards down for our mandatory rest here. Flip our action token, or activation token, and we're going to move the time tracker down one to seven. If we look at our card here, it will go towards the last activated player, and then it's going to attack the nearest player. It's going to move so it can be within range of her, so it's going to move up here. Then one, two, it actually is in range now of her, but it's going to attack the nearest player, which is going to be Basilisk, so he's going to lose one shield. The next one is going to move towards the most distant player, which again is her. Now it can't move through people, but still one, two, it has line of sight to her, and then it's going to attack the nearest player. So Basilisk again is going to get hit, and that's going to be bad news. Basilisk is going to lose his last shield. If he were to take any more damage, he's going to start drawing from our damage deck up here, which is going to be pretty bad, because none of them are any good. So hopefully he doesn't take any more damage. Since our enemies have finished, we're going to gain back our activation tokens, and we get to choose who wants to go first. I think it's going to be Basilisk, just because he's surrounded by bad guys. And we're going to start by using my tail defense. I'm actually going to put it way over in four. I have a plan. It's not a very good plan, but I have a plan. I get to gain one shield for each adjacent enemy. So there are three adjacent enemies to me, so I'm going to gain back my three shields. And now I'm able to move one for every one of those I gained. Well, sadly, I didn't, don't get, I'm not actually going to move because I'm surrounded by these guys and I need to get to this ship. So for my second action, I am going to use my blaster. It deals two damage. I get to roll one die to an enemy within three. If the enemy has shields, I get to roll an extra die on my activation this turn. None of these have shields, so it's not the end of the world. I need to do three damage to one of these things or it's going to be bad news. Let's roll up our one die and see how it goes. I got a shield back. That shield isn't going to help. I'm going to spend one of my focus points and we're going to re-roll this die. I need to get this, there we go, I got plus one. That's gonna do three damage, that's enough to take them out. I'm gonna take out Y2, mainly because they haven't gone yet, so if I take out the Ys, that's probably a better plan. That's why I did it. Ho <laughs> ho I'm a funny guy. All right, that's the end of his turn. We're gonna move all these cards down, and we're gonna move back to the board so I can show you exactly how this all transpired. With our tail defense, we are able to gain our three shields. I'm surrounded by three enemies. I decided not to move afterwards because my goal is that way. And I guess I could have moved actually one, two over to here. Why not move two, three spaces, I guess? Because I think my gun can fire up to three range. I can. And then I'm going to fire one, two, three. You can go diagonal and this is all gridlocked. So these are not, these technically are not blocking anything by going diagonal through here. I'm going to do my three damage to this one right here, which now I probably should have just moved, but that's okay. We did our three damage. It is enough to kill him. He doesn't have any shields, so that one is off the board. That's the end of his activation. I do have to move this time tracker down to six. I have to use the yellow card of our sheet now. There is only one, so it's going to move towards the nearest player and then damage the nearest player. So it's going to move one, two, three, four, five, and its range is two, one, two. It can't quite get there. That's the end. It's going to be Vera's turn now. And Vera has her basic move, is the only move card she has. Her jetpack and her dash are both in her board. 
One of the actions we could perform is a rest action. We could move all this over one. If my jetpack was here, that might be a good plan because then I could just get the, if my jetpack was here, I could do one rest as one of my actions, get the jetpack down, throw it down again and move five and get out of here. But as it stands, that's not gonna help me because it's only gonna move them down one, giving me back my calm wristband. So we're gonna have to use our basic move, which I'm only able to roll one die for. Let's see how it goes. Now we need to get a total of what? Three to get out of here. I got one, two, that's good enough because now, actually I shouldn't be playing down a four. I should play it over here, sorry, that's my fault. This does come back to my hand, so I'm gonna play it again and see what else we get. We get another movement, so that's a total of four movement we have, which is gonna be enough to get her out. If we look here at the board, I can go one, two, three into the ship and I could stay right there if I wanted to. And he can come in diagonally if he wants to. And even if I, and if something really badly happens to him, I could still come out of the ship and help if I wanted to. But I'm gonna just stay right there in the ship and I think that should be pretty good. So she's done. She's gonna flip her activation token. This should be gone. It, I just put it there to symbolize I was doing it, but you just play them and they go away. We're gonna move our cards down. I do get my wristband back, but I don't really need it now. And it's going to now be our red enemy's turn. The two enemies are going to move towards the last activated player and the most distant player and then attack the nearest player. There is some stipulation here because according to our trigger conditions, the ship is not part of the mission board and it can be boarded and exited by players like I've said before, but the enemies will not move toward or target players already on board the ship. So they're not gonna target her as technically the last activator most distant. So that means it's gonna be him as the last activator most distant. So they're gonna move one, one, two is at a range of two to there. And this one will move one, two to right there, and both of them are going to attack Basilis. Basilis has been doing a fantastic job of getting his shields back, so he's only going to take two. But that's not how we're going to do this. We're going to pretend he has zero. I want to demonstrate how this damage deck works. So you're going to take your damage deck, give it a good old truffle shuffle here before the game. And then we're going to set it out there like you've seen down on the next to the board. And for every damage that we take that cannot be blocked by shields, so let's say he has zero, he's going to now take two damage, one from each of these self-destruct robots. Or, of course, if he had one and took two unblockable damage, that'd be two damage he wouldn't be able to block with shields. We're going to draw draw two cards. So our first one is going to be internal bleeding. So we, when this is placed down, we're going to move a damage card one cooldown to the right and place this card on three. So there, you don't have any. So we're going to place this down on three, but we already have a card there. When the way damage works is you're going to remove that card and you get the card back, which is kind of cool. Bad thing is you're damaged. There is no ongoing or when discarded. And during setup, remember I mentioned that these can make the game more difficult per player. So as you're taking damage, you're going to be having more and more things happen to you the more difficult you want the game to be. Since we took two damage, I would have to draw another one. I would have gotten abrasion. And when drawn, move a damage card one to the right and discard this card. So I'd have to move this one to the right and discard this. Now, for example, if I were playing it the most difficult way for myself, so say I've already played through the campaign and I kind of know how a lot of this, the mechanics of the game work and I have a lot of neat strategies and stuff, but I'm playing with somebody who has never played before and is just kind of learning their character. I could then choose to play on the most difficult possible. So when this is discarded, which is right now, I would lose an extra focus here. So I would lose this focus point as this gets discarded back to the deck. Now, of course, if this deck is ever empty, you just shuffle it up and deal them back out. If at any point I can't play a card out here, let's say I've got this one here and I've got this one, this one's a zero, but we're gonna play it just like this. And I go to draw another card, I get a one. I'd have to, can't place it here, can't place it here. I'd have to keep bouncing it. I'd have to get rid of this card then. And I have to take another damage. Oh, I got a three. Or let's say I had this card here and I had one I had to place in three. Well, I can't place it in three, so I have to place it in four. I can't place it. My guy at that point would then be downed. And once you become unconscious, you're gonna to have to wait for somebody to come and heal you. For example, they could use this basic interact, which then I can heal an adjacent unconscious for one plus a die roll. So I could roll this up and I got two. So I could then heal two damage off him. So I could heal, for example, those two if I wanted to. Now, when you heal them, you're not, I believe, discarding them. So that means you're not going to have to deal with the discard on the more harder cards that are out here. But that, and then once that's done, this character then is able to come back up and proceed with the mission. Of course, we'd still need to try to get him some shields because 
things have gone pretty bad. And he could be hit again and fall down straight again. Now, of course, if I'm already on the ship and he becomes unconscious just like it is right now, that means that scenario would end because I've completed the mission parameters of getting my characters onto the ships and he would gain this scar as per the mission parameters and the success and failure of these missions. So I know Basilisk right now has mass chaos going on, but where we stood in the adventure, he actually had only one damage or three shields and he took two damage and it would now be our turn. We're going to activate our tokens and I would just give him a move action. He only has to move one space and he would make it onto the ship. This would bring us to our Mission A Aftermath for C2A. It says right here, I can't help but think this disobedience was all just a show of force. You guys were clearly more than capable of taking out these droids. Though, I don't see why you'd want to cut it so close while also pissing me off. At any speed, get some rest before we continue. So a few hours later, Commander, I hope you guys managed to get some shut-eye because we have a long time ahead of us and we probably be working together for even longer. As it is custom among team members to find trust in each other, I'd find it satisfactory to know a bit more about the band of misfits you've brought together. Care to elaborate on how you all ended up here? At this time, I now have a choice. What will you tell him about yourself? Each player will tell a story about themselves. And depending on what story you choose, you get to mark on your personality one of these different traits. So you're gonna be already gaining some extra tokens after this. Now, from what the designer told me, this is really one of the only parts in the actual campaign where you're gonna be able to make these choices yourself. A lot of these tokens and ways you're gonna be affecting your character and the legacy is all going to be brought out based on story choices. Say you decide to go down a more aggressive choices in your game, you may be getting more of these dominating tokens. Or if you decide to be more of a team player, you might be gaining more of these supportive tokens. And that, of course, is going to affect all the different cards that you have in your hand. And like I said before, you're going to be adding stickers to some of these to help manipulate your cards to be able to affect the paths that you have gone down in this game. There you have it, that's Rogue Angels, Legacy of the Burning Suns. I hope that quick mission was able to give you an idea of how this game plays and see if you're interested during the Kickstarter that is happening February 1st. Again, I'll be putting a link to it right up here. This game to me hits so many check marks that I've been looking for in a game. First, it's a space dungeon crawler type game that I have not seen too many that I've really enjoyed. This one checks off that box. There are tons of different characters, 20 different characters you can pick from, checks off that box. It has the ability to allow the difficulty to be adjusted per character with that damage deck, which is really, really cool. Also, the AI is fantastically quick and it moves along really fast. Your character card placement and playing, the way they are able to be slotted down and shift around on the board based on uh, the rest mechanic, fantastic. Love that mechanic. I also am a huge fan of the way that you can gain these personality tokens. That is mind-blowing and I love it. I am super pumped as to how that's going to be played out. And and I know I've said it more than once, but being able to manipulate your cards as the game goes forward to be able to uh, take advantage of the way that the game is played is fantastic. Branching story paths inside a mission and also a story that can branch out in all different places and you're never going to see it all in one playthrough. Checkmark, bad, that's a fantastic maneuver. And every character is going to have a particular mission that is based on that character alone, that's fantastic. This game checks so many boxes for me that I am super excited for this one. This is an instant back for me. I'll be playing this as soon as this comes to me on this channel, and I'm super pumped for this. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this Kickstarter preview of Rogue Angels Legacy of the Burning Suns. Again, everything you see here is prototype and subject to change as it goes through the Kickstarter. But if this game is shaping up to be how these first few missions play out this is fantastic if you're interested in trying it out i believe there's a tabletop simulator mod out there for you that i believe has 12 missions on him and he has told me that if you do decide to play a tabletop simulator you will not see all 12 because some of the missions are only going to be opened up through certain choices you make which is really awesome i know i promised you a visual of one of the maps that we didn't get to see but here's another one we're on a planet which is pretty awesome so there's again so many different things not 
to mention another check mark. It's just the maps are on a book. There's not tiles laid all over. This is not a table hog. There is a lot going on in this game, but there are, it doesn't take up absolutely your entire table. It's super cool. Not to mention, of course, the box is your ship. How cool is that? All right, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell symbol so you know when more content comes out. Also, please feel free to leave anything in the comments below. I would love to hear from everyone. I'll put it in the description of this video all the different links you will need to learn more about Rogue Angels Legacy of the Burning Suns. Thank you so much for watching, and if you're excited to see what comes next, then I need you to meet me at the co-op shop.